Our topic today is cross-linguistic frame net alignment, the alignment of semantic frames across languages. Uh, and uh, I'll start, and then Ahtu is going to uh, uh, talk about the important part of the talk, and I will finish up. Uh, some of this may be familiar to those of us who, those of you who were at the last talk, but we will be talking about some new material that we've done recently also. Basically, we have created an interactive, intuitive, graphical tool for visualizing alignments between frames and lexical units across different languages. And this tool uses a variety of alignment techniques, we'll describe the techniques, and some new research on evaluating the quality of the alignments. So this is the outline of the talk. Uh, and we're going to start out talking about the situation of multilingual frame net. So the number of frame nets around the world continues to grow. Uh, since our last talk, several more languages have been added. Uh, these are in varying states of development, and many of them are quite far along. And many of them are using frames that are fairly closely related to the Berkey frame net. But they're starting from different places. They have different agendas of what they're trying to accomplish. So the question arises, how similar are the semantic frames across different languages? And now that we have these lexical databases, more than a dozen of them, can they be aligned? Can they be considered as sort of a complete multilingual database? And if we can do that, what would that make possible? What could that be used for? What kind of research? What kinds of applications? So all of them, all of these projects are using semantic frames as their basic structure. And most of them have adopted the Berkeley frame at frames to a considerable degree. And most of them, I should say all of them have said that the Berkeley frame at frames are generally applicable to their language, uh, varying degrees, but in general, the Berkeley frame at frames seem to work well for much of language across you know, many different languages, but they have different objectives and they have followed Berkeley FrameNet to different degrees. So for example, Spanish, Japanese, and Brazilian Portuguese have followed Berkeley FrameNet fairly closely, although they have also added frames in other areas, particularly of the Brazilian FrameNet. And then others such as Salsa for German, French FrameNet, and Swedish FrameNet, and Chinese FrameNet have somewhat more divergence. Uh, the Salsa project started very early and they had a different uh, approach to making frames at the beginning. French frame net has a somewhat different objective. Swedish frame net started with a large national dictionary, large national uh, database, and then added frame net afterwards, and so forth. Also, we should point out that similarity is not the only possible cross linguistic frame relation. So, in principle, frames in other languages can be broader or narrower than the nearest English frame but we don't have a good way of investigating that. We just put that in the background as something we're aware of, but we can't deal with yet. Some of the differences in the point of view or choice of frames are regular and extensive. For example, the difference between satellite frame languages like English and German and verb framed languages like Spanish and Japanese. This is a difference that's well known. It's cross-linguistic. Uh, it's used in linguistic typology, uh, and it is reflected in the choice of frames and the way the lexical units line up across these kinds of differences. So in general, we need an objective measure or several objective measures of how closely other frame nets align with Berkeley frame net and with each other. If we have that kind of a measure, we can study the fundamental research question, how similar are semantic frames across languages? This is Worf Sapir, how to what extent do languages divide the world in the same way? And it has practical applications. So we hope by creating this alignment, we'll be improving machine translation. Uh, we're dealing with cross-lingual question answering, information extraction, and uh, purposes like that. So now Arthur's gonna take over talking about the methods of aligning across languages. Arthur? Okay. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Artur, and you should be seeing my slides now. So, uh, 
first thing when we consider the alignment is of course the size of the databases uh, they have some influence on that since we're using them and all of its components uh, on average uh, they're going to be around 900 uh, and 1200 frames and the lexical units you can see that they vary more so chinese for example has 20000 and some languages like the dutch frame net has only 900 uh, and the only exception here is the asfalda the french frame net that it's very different as colin mentioned they had different goals and they also have a different database um, so one of the first ways to think of aligning frames and the most obvious it would be to try some form of of finding like the equivalent in Berkeley frame net by looking at the frame name or the frame ID. Um, so that that's a good assumption, but sometimes the frame names in other languages are not in English, uh, but they can include some information that reveal to us that we can retrieve it and find the, the English frame. Uh, but also sometimes even when frame names match, we can have different definitions, uh, some different in difference in definitions or difference in core frame elements, which conceptually make it a different frame. Uh, so we also want to look at those effects. So just aligning frame names and IDs is not enough. So one of the first uh, ideas that we can think of is looking at the LUs and trying to find LU translations. So the basic principle is, if frames are equivalent across languages, we expect all the translations of LUs in one source language frame to fall into the same target language frame. Uh, of course, uh, this is just an assumption because maybe in one language, this frame has way more LUs, but it's a first good guess. Uh, of course, this type of approach, it depends on the accuracy of the translations. Uh, and we also have to think that an LU in a frame is one sense of a lemma, which on one hand can help us to, to disambiguate to find the correct sense of the, of the LU to find the best translation. But on the other hand, we also know that we can have wrong translations if we look at the wrong senses. So one way to deal with the census uh, for us was to look at open multilingual word net that has the synsets and try to find from the LUs uh, that we have on frame net, uh, use it as lemmas to find synsets. And maybe with synsets, we would have like an approximation of, uh, we could find the actual sense of the lemma in the frame. Uh, so just to give an example, we have here, uh, we have a source frame net and our target frame net. And source frame net has three frames, one, two, three, and the same with target. And they have different LUs, as you can see. Here we have three, here we have two. And they, they are different. So first thing we have to consider is that when since we only look at the lemmas to start because well the machine doesn't know that we the the frame the lu represents a single sense uh, we have the ambiguity of lemmas plus part of speech so it's possible to have a verb uh, that's shared between two frames even though for each frame it has a different sense so this is one of our challenges um, so when we use uh, multilingual word net, we end up linking each LU to a syn set. So we can have the syn sets in the middle. And of course, one, L, uh, one LU, I'm calling LU, but this is actually the lemma plus a part of speech maps to, can map to more than one syn set. Um, so it's more of a question looking at this network. How can we find uh, the good alignments between frames. Uh, so we define the idea of a match, that is an LU uh, can, we can say that's like a good LU or a match if it finds a way 
through a sin set to the other side, to the other frame map. Um, of course, there are different ways to look at this. We can think of uh, when looking at two frames that align, like frame two, we can try to look at the number of LUs that have a connection to the other side. So in this case, from frame two, we would have two uh, in source frame net, and we would have only one in target frame net. We can also look at the number of scene sets shared. Uh, in this case, there are two scene sets that are connected to them, and they both share it, them because they are both connected to the scene set. But this is just an example. So we do have a lot of ways to treat uh, to treat this type of network between frame uh, net and word net. Uh, a different thing we can do is also look at the frame elements instead of values. So we know that for two frames to be the same, they must have the same number and type of FEs, uh, at least core FEs. And of course, we also know that some of the frame nets were uh, based on Berkeley frame nets. So they also copy the FEs, which can make things easier to identify the equivalence of frames. Some uh, of the databases like uh, FrameNet Brazil uh, have translated some names and created new FEs. So we have a challenge here because now it's not a simple matter of aligning uh, or finding equivalent strings. That also happened with Salsa. So we have this challenge of, well, we need to also deal with some form of translation of FEs. One way to approach those translations of FEs and LUs instead of WordNet is also looking at some form of distributional approach to find a similarity. So in this case, for LUs, to find a translation, we start we use the frame uh, the fast text vectors or MUs when they're aligned uh, in, for different languages. So we can get translation equivalents by use this vectors of many languages mapped to a shared space. And to find this, we can define a neighborhood of the shared space around the vector embedding V of a source language. Um, so just to give this, like the figure here, we can see the L one word, so we can have a word in the, uh, in the source frame that. And we can define this neighborhood here with a threshold that is this area, and we can look at all of the words in this area, in the space. And if some word from L2, in this example, word two is here, then we can say they are a translation. Of course, we have the problem of dealing with a threshold and the size of the neighborhood here. How many vectors do we want to look at? Um, we can also try to find uh, some form of centroid. Uh, so find the average vectors of the LUs of each frame. So taking just the average of the vectors and comparing them, uh, the similarity of those centroids. That's also an alternative. Uh, but we, al we also decided to look at contextual vectors for, for this translations. So we started off using multilingual BERT, uh, and although BERT is pre-trained uh, for multiple languages, of course, it doesn't have any form of guarantee that the languages are aligned. So for example, if we take uh, the word for cat in any language, we have no guarantee that it's gonna be close to cat in English. Uh, so one of the first things we did was fine tune BERT to enforce this alignment at word level. Uh, for that, we use Europol for uh, European languages. And we also use uh, a Japanese corpus based on Wikipedia uh, for the Japanese. And then we can take the, the average contextual vectors of annotated sentences of each frame net for each LU. So we look at the LUs the representation of an LU in an annotated sentence, and we take the average that, of that for all of the sentences that this LU is annotated. Um, 
the transformation of the fine tuning process that I mentioned that uses Europol uh, can be, uh, we can use this figure, uh, this plot to show how it works. So in a way, multilingual bird, we have uh, the, the same word, let's say square in language, in the blue language and in the red language, not necessarily are closed in space. So our idea is to make them close. So here we transform, we align it in order to have squares together, triangles together and circles together. So each one of those geometric figures are, represent a different word uh, that have the same meaning in the two different languages. So just to give an example, uh, when we look at LUs, uh, and we try to, to have this uh, representation in two dimensional space, we would have uh, the, the idea like of identically or same, uh, uh, the frame identicality, the adjective same. And if we look at similarity and uh, an adjective like differenti, which is the opposite, but they should be closed in space. And after we align, we can see that they start to get closed. The same thing happens to company and empresa or peligroso and dangerous. So the idea is that we have this aligned space where uh, things in different languages, uh, words in different languages get together, more specifically LUs, not only words. Uh, so having gone through all of those different approaches to translation and how to use each one of the components in FrameNet, uh, we have to highlight uh, that all of those methods have advantages and disadvantages. So for WordNet, uh, we have this large scale uh, curated semantic groupings of lemmas, which is great, but sometimes we have too many senses and they are difficult to distinguish. So in this example here, we have charge two and charge seven, which the first one is blamed for make a claim of wrongdoing or misbehavior against. And the second one is make an accusatory claim. And it, it came from this example sentences, he charged the di director with indifference and the defense attorney charged that the jurors were biased. We do have of, uh, like they, they are still very hard to distinguish. So we have too many senses. Uh, on our distributional approaches, uh, we have the advantage of being able to measure distances that are arguably semantics. We can define operations over the LUs. We can add, subtract them, but we have the problem of not being easily interpretable. Uh, and also they're based on the word forms not really lemmas or lexemes. And a lot of times uh, we, we need to, th those uh, vectors don't represent, not a lot of times, they always represent a, a single word form, not actual senses. So we have the problem of not actually dealing with polysemy. And Something that can be an advantage or a disadvantage is that they encode subwords, not morph morphemes. Uh, subwords is, of course, when we use them, we assume that meaning is more compositional, which can be a problem. Um, so I'm going to show how uh, now in our visualization uh, tool, I'm going to show how some of those things happen and hopefully also explain how hard it, it, it is for us to identify based on those scores, the scores, how if a uh, frame pair should align or not. So here I have uh, the tool loaded, uh, loaded with sp the Spanish uh, results. And I can start uh, looking at the average core FE name and definition. So this method is looking at core FEs and using vectors to translate them. And I can go into, uh, we can select the judgment frames that include judgment communication, direct address, and judgment of intensity. And here, uh, if I move the threshold to a higher number, uh, that is 0.8 threshold, 
um, then I get only like judgment aligning with judgment in Spanish. Uh, of course, this is correct, uh, but we're not seeing all of the frames here. So that means that, well, uh, we need to lower the score to start seeing the correct alignment between those frames. The problem is when we lower the score, like we start seeing judgment and judgment of intensity, but we also can see a lot of different frames that start showing because of that. Uh, and even if we go and lower it even more to 65, uh, 0.65, and if I restrict them only to the selected frames, now I can see all of them and how they align to each other. Uh, but you can see that they're aligning to more than one frame. So we have found the correct alignment here, but we also included something that we didn't want. So to increase our recall, we had to increase, uh, lose some precision. Then we, uh, to also give you an example, we can also move to a synset based method for the same frames. And again, I can have like a 0.4 score and that's judgment communication, it's here. If I lower it a little bit more, I start seeing judgment, but it's aligning to assessing, which is not the correct alignment. And if I lower it even more, I can see all of the frames I selected again. But interestingly, uh, we also see frames that we don't expect. So should projectiles is here, uh, even though, but we also see judgment communication. So we are we end up like accepting more alignments, even though they're wrong. So we increased our recall at the cost of precision. And here, just to show you why that happened, we have a charge matching with this parar. And this is because we look at the wrong sense in WordNet. And because of that, it happened and we aligned the wrong frames. But this gives us an, an idea uh, that changing the threshold can have a lot of impact on whether we see a frame pair aligning or not. So uh, of course, we, we were trying to find ways to, to see how can we evaluate those alignments. Um, considering all of those scorings that we developed and that we can see how they behave on the actual frames. So uh, to do this quantitative evaluation, we have uh, three main uh, points. First, we have to think of how to identify a gold alignment for each language. So uh, by gold alignment, we mean the alignments that we know they're correct and we should, uh, the system must get them right for sure. So the first question is, can we use the same criteria for all of the databases? And the answer is yes, because we, we want to, we have a very clear idea that the same frame first should share all of its core FEs, but it should also share the name if we know the name and also the ID of Berkeley FrameNet. So the ones that, the ones that I first discussed, like the first technique I discussed is the one that should be used to find the gold alignments. Um, one of the questions, is, another question is, can we assign perfect scores to all good alignment pairs? Uh, this is an important question because although they can align, maybe in another language or even in Berkeley FrameNet, the definition of the frame changed. And because of that, we need to think, well, is the, does this alignment, uh, is this alignment a perfect alignment? So it's important to investigate this. Uh, a second point is after we have the gold alignments is how can we use all of the scores and aggregate them into a single score? Uh, the problem is, as you just saw, the scores give us different results. So we want, and it can get really hard to interpret and understand how the system is behaving, behaving so we need a single score. And again, like I just showed you in the uh, in this small demo, you can see that uh, the distribution of scores vary. When I first used uh, was looking at the core FEs, 
we had to go uh, to 0.65 to see all the alignments. But for scene sets, I had to go to 0.25. Also, uh, the scores can be different due to various reasons. So if I have a lexical frame, I know I can use some LU-based techniques. But if it's non-lexical, then no, I cannot use any of those techniques. Sometimes the databases are incomplete, or and sometimes it's a problem with our other resources. Uh, it could be WordNet, it could be the fast text vectors. Uh, also, one question that we have is like, should we weight some scores more heavily? And that's something that we are going to discuss uh, in a minute. And finally, uh, we need to evaluate the scoring so we can have a simple comparison if well, of what the system says is a good alignment and what are the actual good alignments, a correlation, or we can have a downstream task. Um, so to create the good alignment set, as I said, uh, we say that two frames are the same if and only if they have the same name and core FEs. So not all databases have the names in English. Uh, uh, as the frame name, but they do have some reference to the English name, like Chinese or FrameNet Brazil, and we use that. And we ignore all of the translated names, of course, because that would be risky. We would be relying on the translation quality. And one of the problems we have is that, of course, uh, we have a binary choice. For each frame pair, uh, we have to say if it's gold or not. Uh, so if it's gold, then it has a score of one, assuming that that's the case, but that doesn't really match the idea of the scoring that's continuous uh, of our techniques. So um, here we can see a table of the, the final gold alignment sets and its sizes. So for example, in FrameNet Brazil, we had like 1,092 frames, of those, 597 are golden uh, gold set frames. As you can see, we don't have the gold set for frame net, uh, for Berkeley frame net because all of the other frame nets are trying to be aligned uh, to Berkeley frame net. So it doesn't make sense to discuss its gold set. Um, so again, as I said, we have the different distributions when talking about aggregating the scores. And we can see here that since that base methods are very, have this very spiky distribution while vector-based, they have a single bell that's really high. And because of that, we cannot just like sum them or take average. Uh, we need something more, a little bit more smart. Otherwise we end up uh, having a bias towards the scores that have there are in have higher values in general. Uh, it could work if we had a voting system. So the synset based method could say if they align or not, and the vector base could say that. But we also ran into the problem of finding the thresholds that I showed can be really hard. Also, we have the problem of the binary gold alignments that I just mentioned that we have a frame pair that we know that should align, but our scoring functions, they return continuous values. Um, it's, it makes it hard to, harder to compare a little bit. We also have the gold alignments representing only a small percentage of all possible alignment pairs between the two databases. So I just showed you the table and it looked like a lot of frames are included in the golden set. They are actually are, but the comparison is on frame pairs. So it's kind of like uh, the size squared. So we see that like only 76%, uh, 0.076% of possible alignments are actually gold alignments. And we also have the problem of not, of using correlation uh, tests, it's not a good idea because since this number is so small, most of the uh, possible frame pairs to be aligned, they have a score of zero. So any correlation method will think that we are getting everything right because we're getting the zeros right. 
So we have this problem of imbalance. Um, so to deal with all of those challenges, uh, we decided to try to look at a, a, a downstream task in a way that is training a logistic regression classifier for each language. Uh, each of those classifiers is designed to be training using categorical outputs. That is, uh, they're going to output, in this case, it's gonna, just going to be binary. Uh, they learn how to assign the weights for the inputs. So this is one of the questions we had before. How do we know which scoring method is, bad, is better? Uh, so the classifier hopefully can find that for us. And we also made sure to use cross-validation to avoid any form of overfeeding, although it still can happen with the smaller databases when, and I'm gonna show that. Uh, but, okay, so to this classifier, we have the input is going to be a frame pair. So remember that big number, like I said, the frame, uh, the frame net size square, all of the possible pairs. So we take those pairs, we run all of our scoring functions and find a bunch of scores. And those are the inputs to the classifier. So it's the scores of each frame pair. The output is one or zero that signals whether the frame pair is a good alignment or not. And as I hinted before, we have this challenge now of handling the asymmetrical classes because most pairs should not align. So we only need to find the ones that should. That's what it, what's interesting for us. So here is this, like a simple uh, uh, drawing of the classifier. So the input is the alignment scores for different techniques. So we can have like 0 0.23, 0 0.87. Uh, internally, we know that the model is going to assign scores and probabilities that can be used as those at the aggregated score. So later we can take this model and just use it to look at a more global score, the aggregation of all of the others. And this is the output that's zero or one, whether the frame pair should align and it's going to be optimized to discriminate between the gold set classes. Um, and here is, is what we found running the classifier. When we started looking at the coefficients, we can see the relative enforcement, uh, importance of alignment techniques. Not all of them are listed here, but we can see that in general, every time we looked at core FE names, when they are in English, of course, uh, they end up showing the bad, uh, being the most influential variable. So uh, matching the core FE names means that, uh, for the classifier, this is like the most important thing. Uh, also, you, uh, you can see it here that BERT, for example, when you use the distributional methods, both LU and BERT, BERT especially, it's not it's not, it didn't perform well. As you can see, it's not really relevant to the classifier, relatively speaking, uh, with the exception of French, but French is an outlier here because it has like, it's very, very different from the other databases and it has like a small amount of frames. This is most likely because we, even though we use the annotation data, it's a, a, a data set that's too small for the BERT way of working. So it's kind of like we, we cannot get good representations because we have too few examples. Uh, also, we can see the word net uh, when we use WordNet, it's also not the best. And this is most likely because we have too many senses in WordNet. So like you just saw in the demo, we have the that alignment between judgment and shooting projectile, which happened because only because like WordNet has like so many senses. And you're going to see that some uh, are mis some position, some ranks are missing in this table, especially for Chinese and Japanese, that's because we couldn't uh, have uh, any type of technique based on vectors for Chinese. Uh, 
we we're still working on that, but we didn't have annotation data. And also Chinese doesn't, uh, the data we have, they don't differentiate between core FE or any other FE type. So it's, you can see that only works when we look at all FEs. For Japanese, it's just that we don't have fast text vectors aligned for Japanese. And because of that, we don't see those techniques. Um, uh, so finally, when we look at the, we can look at this coefficient, coefficients, but we also need to think about how to evaluate the classifications. Uh, so of course we have asymmetrical distribution of classes. So accuracy is not a good metric because the model can learn to just say, well, this pair doesn't align and it's gonna perform really well on accuracy. Rather we rely on precision and recall and we also, and by looking at different thresholds of the classifier scoring function, uh, we can understand the trade-off between precision and recall. So the precision is of all of the uh, alignments that the model said they, sh they are gold alignments, how many of those are actually correct, the percentage? While the recall, if it is all of the gold alignments, how many did the model find? Um, and we can use the F1 score, that's the aggregation of the two as an overall measure. So this is what we found for all of the databases with the exception of French. Um, we can see that uh, the curves, are, uh, they're uh, decent, and, but we see this plateaus forming, especially for Chinese, Swedish, and Japanese. This happens, it's because like, the model is still linear, uh, uh, still a linear model. So the distribution difference that I mentioned before between synset and, and uh, distributional based methods, it's being reflected here. But that, as you can see, we still have, uh, we can see, see that the recall uh, when it starts increasing, that is when we start like finding more of the gold alignments, our precision drops. Uh, so that means that we are starting to find also like saying that some alignments are good alignments when they are not. Uh, we can look at the F1 scores and in order, they're in order here. So you can see, we can see that FrameNet Brazil, Spanish FrameNet and Japanese FrameNet are really comparable. And this is mostly because uh, they, they are somewhat similar to Berkeley FrameNet, but they also have uh, some work put into them that changed and added, added new frames. And it's interesting to see that they are all comparable. We do have Salsa here with a very high F1 score. That probably means that's probably caused by the fact that the, we had like a small gold set for Salsa. So even though it's a very good result, it's probably not accurate. And we are going to investigate that further with actually manually aligned data for German. And Dutch frame net is also very similar. Uh, and Chinese, which is the one with the lowest score, it, this is caused not because of any problem with the database, but rather it, it's because of, we didn't use all of the techniques that we could because we didn't have the annotation data, but still it's a decent result, result considering that we only use synsets and FE alignments. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Colin and he's going to discuss some applications of what we did and uh, talk about our conclusions to you. You're muted. Uh, Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Uh, just a note to say about the curves, they're not completely smooth and regular, but these are kind of ordinary precision recall curves, which suggests that we're in the right ballpark in what we're doing, uh, although the methodology is kind of unusual in certain respects. So I'd like to talk about the applications and inclusions. Uh, we have further research that we'd like to do in this direction. 
uh, as uh, Ahru mentioned, one of the first things we want to do, there's current work on uh, a new German English frame net, uh, a new, new German frame net that we can compare to English that will build on salsa and expand it. And we're hoping that the new manual alignments uh, can be compared to this automatic alignment that we're working on. Um, so we're eager to have that uh, since it'll be one of the few sort of deliberate alignments across languages uh, within the frame net context. Uh, we also want to look at uh, some of the more recent vector embeddings. BERT is not the end of the world. There are more uh, new vector methods coming out all the time. And perhaps some of the newer methods will give us some better results. And we want to look again at whether there's any way to get uh, better contextual information out of the annotation data. Uh, since the annotation data is actually considered to be of good quality and is manually done, it should be usable. Um, then um, we we'll want to add more languages to Vito XF as the data becomes available. There are a number of languages there have pretty extensive frame nets. We haven't got the data and included it yet. And we also want to begin looking at a wider range of genres uh, in the English frame net, particularly. Uh, we started annotating the TED Talk as part of the uh, parallel annotation project. And we want to add that data and other uh, texts of different data, different genres, and see how that affects these results. Some of the other frame nets already have a greater range of genre, but the English is kind of limited. Um, this should have applications. Uh, we'd like to test it on a number of standard NLP tasks just glue and XNLI uh, to see if the information provided by these kinds of alignments can improve results on those. And we'd also look at some typical downstream applications, such as cross-linguistic question answering, cross-linguistic information extraction, uh, social network extraction, sentiment analysis cross-linguistically. Uh, Theoretically, these kinds of alignments of frames are telling us something fundamental about the differences between languages and the similarities between languages. They should help with these kinds of applications. So we can say that every new frame net constitutes an experiment in cross-linguistic frame semantics. So to let, collectively, they form a basis for research into framing across languages and the search for semantic universals. So we devise a suite of methods for measuring the similarity of frames. Uh, and we've created and we are distributing uh, V2XF, an intuitive interactive visualization tool. Um, as you can see from the uh, little demo we gave, uh, it's uh, interesting to look at, but it's also complex and sometimes confusing. And so as part of the evaluation of that, we created a new suite of tools to evaluate the alignments. And uh, there's lots of work to do. We hope that you'll join us in this research. This is supported by the National Science Foundation. And my thanks also to FrameNet Brazil for encouraging Ahto to come to Berkeley and work with us. It was very productive, very helpful. And we're especially grateful to the FrameNets who provided their data for the study. Again, we hope to have more soon as more frame that shared data with us. So thank you for listening. We welcome your questions. Stay well, stay sane.